Hey everyone, today is the day. It's the big day. Adobe has launched the responsive update to Adobe Muse that we've all been waiting for for a very, very long time. This version has been in beta for a while. I know some of you have beta tested the uh, beta version, but now it is launched, it is public, it is done, and it is really, really cool. So today we're going to be talking about the five, well, at least in my opinion, the five most significant features, the first of which, obviously, the responsive design tools. And I'm just going to be going over this stuff very, very lightly to show you what's new and to get you guys excited. And then I'm going to have tutorials going into detail about all these things very soon. So first of all, these responsive features, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with responsive design, uh, responsive design is a combination of different things going on. One is that the site is essentially elastic or fluid. And if we take a look at this in the browser, you can see that as I make the browser smaller or larger, the text response and about, which is in the middle here, stays in the middle. So there is a fluid response taking place as the browser changes size. But there's another thing going on too, and that's that we reach these points where the layout is no longer practical and the layout will change completely. So see right there, we went from a two column text layout to a one column text layout. And that happened because two columns, they were getting narrow, they were only going to get more narrow and less practical as the screen shrunk to mobile sized devices. And because of that, it switched, it switched it over to a layout that made more sense for a more narrow size. And you'll notice there it switched again. And what's happening, a few things are happening. And we get to decide all of what we want to happen in Adobe Muse. Uh, here we have this gallery, which is one column. And if we go back to the widest size and look at that gallery, it was two columns, but two columns became less practical and it snapped and switched. There's also a map down here that gets smaller. I believe it even changes shapes when we get all the way down to the most narrow breakpoint. And some of you might be thinking, well, where are the breakpoints? How do you decide where to put the breakpoints? And a lot of it has to do with, uh, ironically, when your design breaks. It's the point at which your design snaps into another design, which is why you could call it a breakpoint. Uh, but it's also the point at which it breaks and becomes broken that you would want to consider adding a breakpoint. So within Adobe Muse, we have this bar across the top. You may have guessed it is called the breakpoint bar. And on the breakpoint bar, uh, we've also got this handle where we can simulate the browser getting progressively more narrow. And you can see here, these breakpoints have already been added on this demo file, which you can download uh, from the welcome screen. And as we go more and more narrow, there's another breakpoint here. So essentially, as you're designing, uh, it's arguable whether or not you should design the most narrow breakpoint first or the widest breakpoint first. You could design a desktop site. I'm sure many of you have already designed desktop sites and then you can retrofit those to be responsive. Or if you're building from scratch, there's something known as the mobile first approach where you start with the most narrow, the smallest, the most scrunched and least practical version of your site, and then you build out from there. But uh, just check this out. As I go more and more narrow, uh, let's say we get to the point again where I don't like this layout. Uh, there's a little plus sign. Whenever you're dragging this handle, there's a little plus sign. You can add a new breakpoint, and then you can start going nuts with rearranging things. Um, there's even a feature here, and I'll go into these in greater detail. You can hide certain elements in certain breakpoints. So if you get to a device size where the gallery just doesn't make sense anymore, uh, you can choose the gallery, right click it, and you can tell it to hide in this breakpoint. And on the layers list, that's really just a matter of disabling the visibility of that layer. It remembers which breakpoint you're on when you disable or enable the visibility of a layer. So you can make each one different from each other one. Now we also have features here under transform where we can choose and these things you'll also find across the bar at the top. I like to look at it in the uh, transform box because it labels these things uh, in a more verbose fashion than it does up here. Like pin for instance. Uh, you guys may be familiar with pinning something to the browser where as you scroll it does not move. But now with responsive, since it's responding to the width of the browser changing, you can choose to keep the same spacing on the left side as the browser gets wider to the left. You can keep the spacing the same on the right side. For example, in your navigation, your navigation may not be pinned. It may scroll up and down and up and down. 
uh, but if you wanted your navigation to be over on the right hand side and you wanted it to maintain this 20 or so pixel spacing on the right, then you wouldn't want it pinned to the center because then as the browser gets wider, it'll add space to the right and it will equally add space to the left. That's what the center option does. So you'd want to switch the pinning to the right. Some of these things are more intuitive than others, but when you start building, they start to make a lot of sense. So I'm going to go into these again in detail, great, great detail in tutorials that I've got coming at you guys soon. So this responsive feature, this is the really big deal. We are essentially making things fluid, deciding how we want them to pin, and we are adding breakpoints and deciding how we want things to change altogether. And we'll go into great detail about what you can change from breakpoint to breakpoint and how easy it can be to retrofit a non-responsive site into a responsive site. So a lot of really cool stuff coming soon. So now there are a few more features and a lot of people are gonna be focused on the responsive stuff and ignore these other additional features, but um, I'm kind of going in order of what I think is most significant to what I think is least significant. And you don't have to agree, but I think the responsive stuff is definitely the most significant. Let's go to another page I have here. And another big thing, I think this is really big because I've created a widget on museresources.com that does this, but it's now built into Adobe Muse and that's having your rollovers animated instead of just being static. So let me preview this page in the browser real quick. I have this more about us button and when I mouse over it, see it fills the box and then the text uh, sort of inverts with the box. Uh, so it looks like a solid inversion, inverted version of itself. If I go back and select this and then in the top left corner, click on normal, where I would normally switch to my rollover state, which is how I created the alternate appearance of this button in the first place. And these buttons, again, are a free download from museresources.com, so you can go grab these. Uh, but with this, there's now a transition little disclosure triangle. And you can expand this, and you can choose to have it fade into this state. So when you reach the rollover uh, state, when the mouse goes over it, it will fade with a delay if you so choose a duration, which I'm going to make quicker than one second. One second's a very slow fade. I would say 0.3 is a good happy medium most of the time because a slow fade makes the computer feel slow. You don't want your viewers, your users, to feel like their computer is slow or more importantly, they'll blame you. They'll say your website is slow. Uh, a lot of people think their computer is slow, but they'll be, qu they'll be quick to blame you if the last website they went to felt faster than yours because why would yours be slower than theirs if it wasn't a slow website? So I'm gonna set the duration on 0.3 and then speed, this is really cool. You can have the animation ease, so instead of being a full speed transition from the moment your cursor reaches it, it'll kind of accelerate. And when you have it on ease or ease in and out, it's going to accelerate and decelerate. So it's gonna be very, very smooth. So ease and e ease in and out are the smooth ones and they just do so at a different rate of easing. If you think of it like accelerating in your car and slowing down in your car, you could do that aggressively or you can do that slowly and you'll find differences between ease and ease in and out. Or you can just have it ease in and then snap to the ending or ease out and snap at the beginning and then smoothly fade out. So think about ease out as being at full speed in your car instantly and then slowing down with the brakes and ease in would be to slowly accelerate from a red light but then hit a wall <laughs> so you instantly uh, decelerate. And then there's linear. If you don't want any fading or easing whatsoever, you can just choose uh, linear, which is the least beautiful by far of all these. So I'm gonna choose ease in and out so it's smooth on the get-go and smooth when it stops. And then here's the thing, a lot of you are gonna mouse over this and then you're gonna mouse away and you're gonna say, wait a minute, I thought it eased in and out, but look, when I move away, it snaps. What we did is we, we chose to ease in and out, meaning the animation starts slow and ends slow, um, on rollover. We didn't say anything about rolling back out to the normal state. So that's one thing to be aware of with this is when you go in and you choose to fade the rollover, you actually also have to go back to normal and choose to fade the normal state. And what's cool about this is you can actually have it fade to the normal state differently. You could have it fade out slowly even though it fades in quickly. Let's do point two for the fade into the rollover state and then we'll do one full second for fading out of the rollover state. So watch this, when I mouse over it, it's gonna quickly fade in, and then when I mouse out, see it slowly fades out. So that can be a cool effect. It's sad that you're moving away from it. It's all excited that you're moving over it, and then it's sad that you're moving away from it. So that can be a cool effect. Uh, the reverse is generally, uh, generally it feels sluggish, so I wouldn't highly recommend the opposite of that. 
but that's a pretty neat trick. Uh, there is a list of properties, which I'll put in the tips and tricks section of museresources.com. There's a list of properties that you can animate. You can't animate everything, but as you can see by this, you can animate text color, you can animate the fill color, uh, you can actually also animate a background fill if you want to switch from one image to another image. You can animate the border. A lot of cool stuff, really. A ton of cool stuff. So I'm going to post a list of what you can animate and just assume that if something's not on that list, you probably can't animate it. Um, but there's plenty that you can. So let's take a look at my next favorite feature, or my third favorite feature, and that is this new spacing trick, which I don't know if anyone's talking about, but it's really cool. It's stolen from InDesign, and it's a matter of selecting a group of items. See how these are all touching each other? I want these to be a little bit spaced out, but of course, evenly spaced out. And I want to do so just by dragging. So this is a brand new feature. If I get all these selected, as many of you know, you can drag the edge of your selection to scale all of these items. So I don't want to do that. I want to space them. So now you can hold the Alt or Option key when you drag the edge, and it will instead increase the spacing, which I think is really cool. And that's why I'm talking about it third before a couple of other big things, because I think this is a big, big thing. I'm going to use that a lot for sure. It's especially helpful when you're doing responsive layouts and you have multiple columns. And as the browser gets smaller, you want to adjust the width of those columns manually instead of allowing the browser to do it, because sometimes the browser won't do it the way you want it to. So this can be extremely helpful. And it's quick, super easy and quick. The next big thing, the fourth big thing, we now have our CC Libraries panel which a lot of you may recognize from Photoshop and Illustrator if you're Creative Cloud users. So you may want to be using this in Adobe InDesign. You may want to be using this in Adobe Illustrator. You may want to use it in Photoshop. But the bottom line is it connects them all. So if you're creating an icon in Illustrator like these icons here, you can just drop it into this panel and then you can go to Photoshop or Muse and you can grab it. Uh, so it makes it really easy to go between them. So let me open up this here. I've got these icons that I've created, and these are part of the Icon Mega Pack on museresources.com. Let's say I've just created the icon in Illustrator, or that I'm editing the icon in Illustrator, and I want to go and use it in Muse. I can just click and drag it from my canvas directly into the CC Libraries panel. And up here, I can actually click and create new libraries. So I can do it on a per project basis. I don't have to do it uh, with all of my elements from every project mixed into one giant pile. So say you're doing a website for a client, put all your client colors in here the, from their branding guidelines, your layer styles, text styles, graphics, logos, all that good stuff. And then you can hop from application to application. So let's say I want to go into Muse and I want to drop in one of these icons. I can just go to my CC libraries. There's my new cloud icon, which wasn't there when we started. I just put it there in Illustrator. And I can drag it onto the canvas and scale it and put it in one of these circles. And now the client may say, OK, I like that, but can we make the icon gold and the circle black? Uh, absolutely. Let's say black is one of their colors. I've already got it saved on the panel here. If I didn't have it saved already, I could choose the color from my normal colors up here. And then from the bottom of the CC Libraries panel, there's a little color swatch where I can add it. But I've already added it, so I've got these colors here to choose from. And I'm going to choose black. And then I want to grab one of these icons, but they're not gold. And as many of you probably know, um, gold isn't so much a color. I mean, it's like yellowish, orangeish. But it requires a little bit more than that, like a complex gradient showing reflections. So you may have noticed that I have that going on, and it's a Photoshop style. So if I hop into Photoshop, and I go and I drag one of these in here, uh, let me start with the globe. I'll drag the globe in, and I've got it here. It's black on black, so I can't even see it. But I'll hit return to place it, and I'll click my layer style, and boom, now it's gold. That easy. Uh, but the thing is, it's still an SVG graphic, so it's not going to bring the gold uh, layer style over. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to come over here and right click, and I want to rasterize this layer. And now that it's rasterized, it, the, the layer style is applied to it in such a way that if I bring it back, it's going to bring it over with the layer style, because it's like a PNG now, essentially. So now I'm going to hop back over here, and I've got my gold icon. I can drag it in and I can size it how I want to, and there we go. Now, that quickly, I've got my gold icon. I've used three applications to make this happen, but I never even had to hit save. I never had to save a file and go look for it. It is that easy. They just connect to one another. And in most applications, in Muse, for example, um, 
you can double click and edit one of these things. So if it's not what you want, you can go and you can make a change to it. The problem with colors, as you just saw, is whatever you have selected will get that as a color fill when you click on it. <laughs> so it's hard to double click on something uh, in order to edit it without accidentally applying it. Uh, so you could do a right click or a two finger click and choose edit if you want to edit it without accidentally applying it. So that's pretty cool. So CC library is a great way to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth from all of your CC applications. Super duper cool. So now that kind of brings us to the fifth and final, which is some enhancements that they've made to SVGs. We can now do more with our SVG graphics. So I'm gonna scroll down here, get some empty space. Uh, one of the new things we can do, which I think is kind of interesting, is when we have an SVG graphic now, we can crop it. Um, you wouldn't necessarily want to crop uh, an icon, especially, but if you have a complex composition and it's too wide or too tall, something like that, you can hold the command key and drag the bounding box to crop it. So if I wanted half of a globe, there's my half of a globe. Now, another side effect I found, or a little trick that I found, is if I make it a little bit bigger, again, I'm holding command, which is control on the PC. If I make this a little bit bigger, Another one of the tricks that we have that is new is we can apply a fill color. And if I apply, let's say I apply a white fill to this, now it's in a white box, which I have custom control over the size of as I click and drag. Another cool thing is I can change the corner radius. So I could say I want the corners to be round. And if I do an outrageously high radius, it will automatically apply that in the form of a circle if my box is a perfect square, which it was close enough, it looks like, but I'm just, again, I'm eyeballing this, so, you know, it's not gonna be perfect. But now that I've got that circle created, it's one object, it's one icon, and it's vector, so this can be scaled, and I don't have to worry about losing, <laughs> I accidentally held shift there, I don't have to worry about losing uh, quality as I scale it. See, the quality is gonna stay perfect because it's an SVG graphic and the corner radius or the circle that it's inside of is gonna stay perfect because it's not a graphic, it's a box created by Muse which is based on mathematics, it's not based on pixels. So the quality of that is going to remain perfect. And now I could even go in here and I could do a rollover state and because this color was created by Muse, I could change the color. I could have it be really whatever color I want. And then I could even now apply a fade. So how cool is that? That's all based on one single SVG graphic that I've now got a circle and it fades to a color and that's all using an SVG. There's another enhancement that they've made to the way we work with SVG graphics and that is that we can create a slideshow and now within a slideshow we can have SVG graphics which is super neat if you guys have complex SVG graphics. You wouldn't necessarily use it with uh, icons unless you wanted a slideshow of icons, you can do whatever you want. Uh, but as you drag in SVG graphics, it treats them the same way as photographs and adds them to your slideshow. And because they're SVG, they never lose quality, even if we go and we set this to resize to stretch to the full browser width. If I go preview this in the browser, it's going to be huge, it's going to be cropped, it's not going to look right. Uh, but if you add an SVG graphic of, let's say, rolling hills and a beautiful blue sky, uh, because SVGs can be that complicated, then it would not lose any quality as you scale and as you mess around with it. Uh, and more importantly, as the browser scales, because the user can make it bigger or smaller and they don't have to worry about losing quality. So that quality is now infinite because it's an SVG graphic. And if you guys want to download 458 SVG files, uh, you can go to museresources.com. I do have for sale a big icon pack of 458 vector icons. They're all SVG, and you can see here how that works in action and it's only 20 bucks. So check that out if you want. And uh, that's essentially what's new. So this update is huge. There's a lot to talk about. I'm gonna go into detail about all this stuff, especially the responsive stuff. I'm gonna have detailed tutorials for every little detail, every nook and cranny of what you can do in creating a responsive website and adjusting the way it responds to the browser. So stay tuned, subscribe if you haven't already, Go download free stuff from museresources.com and I'll have more coming at you guys soon.